name's Thomas Coyne. I'm the chief instructor at Survival Training School of California. I'd like to thank the Mindshare uh, people for having me and all of you for attending. It is an honor and a pleasure to be here. So uh, I'm going to get in a little bit to, in, to wilderness survival. Uh, I only have 15 minutes, so I can't teach you too many techniques. I can't really teach you how to make a fire with sticks here, how to find water, all that. What I'd like to give you, do, uh, what I'd like to give you is an overall impression of what it really is all about. I'd like to give you a little bit of a springboard where you can leave here, and hopefully this will garner some interest in the subject, and hopefully that if you do decide to research it further, further this will give you a, a, a good way to start. Okay, this is uh, the property, the acreage that I, uh, main acreage that I teach off of in one of the little huts we built up there. So unveiling the wild, the wild like apocalypse, right? So how does this have to do with a, an apocalypse? When we think of an apocalypse, we think everybody, everything being completely destroyed, right? Um, and I'll tell you what, wilderness survival was so magical about it for a lot of people when they start to see it in play, is this is the closest thing you can do to making something from nothing. This really is the art and science of going out there with just your own two hands and coming back with a fire, with meat, with rope. Okay, all these things that we built civilization out of, the calendars are carved on stone. Okay, that's all straight from the earth. And this is about as intimate you can get with it and with yourself. Um, I'll tell you what, a lot of people like to question reality. You know, oh, you know, what's the nature of reality? Uh, when it's, you know, you've had about 1,000 calories in five days, 120-something degree temperatures, your, your feet, the skin's like falling off. You'll question yourself a lot, but you will have no doubts about reality. <laughs> To try and avoid it, you have no doubts. So a little bit about me. Here's the guy talking up here. So uh, I have a background in uh, wildland fire and rescue. Uh, generally, when you see these big fire lines out here, they would throw me at it sometimes um, out of a helicopter. Uh, <laughs> I've worked for Cal Fire. They were CDF back in my day. The United States Forest Service and Kern County Fire Department. I've worked on um, state-of-the-art four-wheel drive fire engines that could do everything from go up like huge inclines to um, put out structure fires. I've been a helicopter repeller, helicopter hoist rescue. I was on the first, I was on the rescue team for the first civilian space launch. I don't know if you guys heard the X Prize. That was one of the highlights of my career right there, yeah. That was awesome. I was part of the aerial burn that saved Carmel, 80,000 acre aerial burn that saved Carmel by the sea. Um, I've done high and low angle ropes rescue, confined space rescue, hazmat. Um, helicopter hoist rescue was a repeller, a lot of the air traffic control stuff. So I have uh, enough about me, it's getting a survival, right? Uh, I'd like to dispel a few of the myths uh, about wilderness survival, because there, there are a lot of uh, myths around wilderness survival, because it's mostly practiced in theory. Who wants to try it out for real, right? <laughs> well, I have tried it out for real. Um, I come from a results-oriented background. When things are on fire, you either put it out or you don't. You, there's mandatory results, and wilderness survival has mandatory results. Before I, I wanted people to trust me with their lives, I had to know I could trust myself with my own life in a wilderness survival situation. So I hiked 100 miles across the Sierra Nevada with no food or water shelter. Or, there's my fire-making device on my hip there. And uh, 130 miles solo from the Badwater Basin of Death Valley. In the summer, it was about 113 when I started, about nine miles to the first water hole. I didn't know if I could, yeah, I thought it might be over the first, before I got to the first water hole. Um, nothing really grows in Death Valley, so that's how you get shade in the daytime. That's basically, I just shaded up the whole day and made the 20-something uh, dis mile distance between water holes in the evening. That's how you do the desert. So um, I've thrown myself at this so my students can learn from my mistakes. Um, so some of the misconceptions in there. Um, first, I'd like to say, you don't have to be a, like a Navy SEAL or Jeremiah Johnson to be interested in wilderness survival. <laughs> okay. This is, the, this is an advertisement for a TV show. To show you how realistic these TV shows are, this is for their desert episode. I wear a, you can tell what season it is, right? I wear a big fleece black jacket when I go in the desert in summer, too. <laughs> okay. I'm sure they're great at their trip. You don't have to be like them to, to be into it. In fact, most of my students are business professionals. They look mostly like you. Okay, outdoor adventures. People, hey, you know, I'm going to go and hiking in Thailand next month. I don't know my guide. Just in case, why don't I learn how to make a fire from sticks with you? Okay, you see this guy right here? That's how they all looked before that picture was taken. That's, <laughs> I don't know if you can see the look on that guy's face, but it's pretty awesome. 
And why, why wouldn't someone love this? Why, why wouldn't you uh, appreciate, you know, being able to go out into the field and, and cut down the right uh, stalk and roast the blue agave style sweet cactus, build a hut out of brush and sleep in it by a fire you made with sticks, you know, go pick the right plant and weave it into a rope, you know, strip off some bark and cure your girlfriend's bug bite, and he feels pretty happy about that. <laughs> okay, that sounds pretty neat, right? And when you, and when you start to see it like that, um, it is really neat. And, and you have to be advised, this is a thinking man's game. This isn't really a tough guy thing. If you just go in there with brute strength and ignorance, you'll get yourself killed. Okay, you're going to have to stop and analyze every aspect of what you're doing. Okay. And uh, in practice, wilderness survival is an extreme critical thinking exercise. It is a critical thinking exercise. And I say extreme because there's extreme physical um, consequences for failure. Okay, you will make the, ro the right choice in that. And that's what attracts, to, attracts some people to it for a hobby, for the training. They want that challenge. Okay, now the study of wilderness survival is an, is an advanced interdisciplinary study, uh, science. Okay, it incorporates biology, emergency medicine, physics, botany, natural history, and more. So approach it as such. And what I mean is I, I, pull, I pull tips from all these things, from all these things when I'm uh, problem solving in the field. Okay, so it's physics, it's not folklore, it's not ancient Indian magic. Um, this is all these techniques are repeatable. And once you have that kind of understanding, you won't be fooled into thinking, well, the, the bottle melts at 300, the water boils at two, so I can swing the plastic water bottle over the fire, right? <laughs> no, it's in the manuals. So one of our students didn't believe us, he thought he'd try it. Instead, you'll be familiar with things like the Liedenstein effect and the thermal insulating properties of steam. And you'll know that you could put a red hot rock inside that plastic bag and that it'll be okay. And that if it's hot enough to make steam, it won't melt the bag. And that once it cools down to where it can't ma uh, make steam, it's not hot enough to melt the bag. Now I say that's the physics, the natural history, that's how Indians cooked in baskets and things like that. Native peoples cooked in baskets and things like that before there was metal pots. Okay, it's really neat. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I'm still a little fascinated by it all. I still haven't gotten sick of it, yeah. Like, did you see that? <laughs> There's a hot rock boiling in water. Okay, people think of this as an animalistic thing. You got to be like the animals. That's the last thing you want to do. Interestingly enough, it's the two traits that make you the most human, okay? That separates us from the rest of the animal kingdom that you'll rely on there the most that will separate you. I'm going to make sure I'm not walking off the edge. That will separate you, that are going to make you the most successful out here, okay? And you see a lot of these traits for success and failure in wilderness survival are just like life, okay? These two traits are your amazing body and your amazing mind, okay? You put that company, all the women there are like, yeah, that's what I'm talking about. <laughs> you put these things two together, and the human being is unstoppable. Okay, you got blind guys with diabetes climbing up Everest. You got people shooting rockets to the moon. I mean, there's nothing we can't do when we put our minds to it and this amazing body. Okay? And uh, a tip, any great physical effort will eventually become a mental one. It will be your mind that gets you through that. That's why that mental fortitude is so very important. Your body gives out pretty quick, believe it or not. Um, wilderness, let's, uh, let's give a little bit of overview of the, actually a wilderness survival situation. And you'll see how it overlaps with all kinds of disasters, with all kinds of failures, okay? The two primary killers in wilderness survival. <laughs> it's not these guys. Hypo uh, is exposure, okay? Exposure is one. Hypothermia, hyperthermia. This is an old field course instructor I had sucking down some awesome water. You won't be picky about water when it's that hot. <laughs> and catastrophic falls. You probably won't have the hard hat on. People get lost out there, and they're scared to death to spend a night in the woods with nothing. And they will climb up any cliff or try to get down any gully to get out of that situation. Okay, some of the common mistakes that you're going to, in wilderness survival, let's go over those, okay, so you don't make them. Um, now, the three underlying principles in wilderness survival uh, emergencies, before I get into that, I'll talk a second about disaster synergy. All this training I've had in, in crashing vehicles and hazmat incidents and, and all these things, you'll see a disaster synergy occur. With human-caused disasters, not earthquakes and things like that, with human-caused disasters, there's always a disaster synergy. There's always a chain of events 
that leads to the actual disaster. And I point that out so people can recognize that in their own life, in their own situation, okay, and not, and not succumb to it. They, you could think of a million times where if I would have just hit the brakes right here, I'd still have that girlfriend, that job, that whatever, <laughs> right? Same thing with wilderness survival. If I would have just turned around before I ran out of water, okay? Underestimating the task. <laughs> oh, I've been there a million times. I don't need to bring a kit. Oh, that river doesn't look that fast. Underestimating the task. And preparedness. The most common survival situation is the lost day hiker. People don't know how to prepare and they don't prepare. And training. Um, there's a lack of good training in this field. It's hard to find. And um, most backpackers have little to no training in wilderness survival. It's amazing um, how little training is. The initial steps you're going to take. Okay, I'm going to speed through this here. Initial steps to take if you find yourself in this situation. So remember those things. Don't die of exposure or fall. Okay? <laughs> Calm down and focus your mind. That's going to be your first thing. Your mind is going to be your most powerful instrument in a survival situation, any survival situation. So take the time to tune it properly. When they shot us in a little cockpit into the pool to, we had to climb out. It's called dunker training. Usually military guys get to go through it. They said when you hit the water in that cage and you're strapped in, first three seconds we want you to just count to three. Just once you hit the water, count to three, then do everything. You're like, yeah. As soon as I hit the water, I'm out, right? <laughs> but I'll tell you what, it worked really good. As soon as I hit the water, you're, you're nervous. You're in a cage going in the water. <laughs> <laughs> you hit the water, I counted to three, all my training flashed before my eyes. Calm me down, instantly know what to do. Okay, you're a mind, you're not a body. The, the body is the instrument of the mind. Attain situational awareness. Some people say hike out. Some people say stay, stay put. That, that depends on your situation. Does anybody know I'm gone? Do I have the things I need to spend the night? Am I on trail? Am I off trail? Okay, Th that's going to be your situational awareness. Am I, am I physically capable? First thing you should do if you ever lost, get to a high point. You might be right there by that road, but you want to see it. Okay, and a real quick tip you might want to take away. Water runs in lines and pools in circles, and it has associative green belts. Look for those green belts if you need water. And the nearest water holes to where you're lost is where they'll look for you as well. And go about everything with an indomitable will. <laughs> there may be a big voice in your head saying, I'm, I'm about to die, and a little whisper saying, oh, you could do this. That's the only voice you need to listen to. Okay? Never, ever go out. Go about everything with an indomitable will. Okay? And by all means, um, please, make yourself visible to your rescuer. They never find anybody because they made a cool signal. They stumble across them. Guys will do everything. Make a little shelter, boil some water, all this stuff. They never make a signal. Okay, make a signal. They'll fly right over you a million times. Okay, it, make a signal. <clears throat> okay, so be prepared. The best thing I could tell you is to be prepared. Some of us, you know, just standing there and looking at the edge isn't enough. Okay, we want to get our stuff together and we want to go over. Okay, the view isn't good enough. So if you are going to engage in any exceptionally dangerous task, you are going to be out there in the outdoors. Be prepared. Okay, I could, I could tell you that much now, instill that. That's why exposures are the number one killers. The lost day hiker, 75 degrees in a day, nice day in Southern California in December. La la la, lost at night, now it's 32 degrees and they're out there in the nice shorts that they look great in. Okay. <laughs> I've seen you out there, a lot of you do, it's okay. <laughs> so, so be prepared, okay? One pound, that kit right there weighs one pound, and you don't even need all that. It's, it's not much bigger than the hand, and you'll be able to tackle all this for a few days, okay? If you are gonna be prepared, make sure your gear's been proven in the field, don't get the coolest, newest survival gear, and don't get anything with a celebrity endorsement. Some things you could do that, you know, your Nikes, but here's the thing. You ever see, uh, you all ever open up a medical magazine and see the new Dr. Oz sy syringes? Oh, I want the new Dr. Oz syringe. They can better be good. Okay? This is emergency gear. It be, should be, look for endorsements by professional rescuers and organizations like that. These guys, celebrities, man, yeah, put my face on it. Heck yeah, I don't care what it does. Give me some money, put my face on it. Heck yeah, that's how they're earning a living. Okay, Red Cross will be less uh, likely to steer you wrong. And uh, seek training. Get a little, if you're going to be doing pursuits in the outdoors, just get a little bit of training. My classes aren't that expensive, and we're right up the hill. Okay? <laughs> you do what, what I mean is, is don't, you don't want your first time trying some emergency technique or gear when, is when your life depends on it. 
when the wind's blowing and you're soaking wet and you're afraid to die. Because you got too much on your mind to learn how to use some piece of gear. Okay? Train in the conditions you may be facing. Don't be afraid. Okay, and when it's controlled like this, don't be afraid to get a little cold, a little wet. Okay, don't sterilize your environment. So then when it hits you in the field, you've dealt with it before and you know you can make it. That's one of the brush shots I built too. Be picky about your survival instructors. <laughs> You're laughing, but if you Google pics, wilderness survival instructor, this is an actual ad for this guy as a survival instructor. It says, it says meet your survival instructor. This is him. So it's not a joke. No, I can't. There is no Red Cross Wilderness Survival Certification. Most of these guys have not been in a real outdoor emergency. And they're going to tell you how to deal with one, right? That's great, yeah. <laughs> the look on the face is the best part, right? That's the, <laughs> it's not the outfit, it's the look with the outfit. This is the best classroom. Get out there and train in the field. What is 100% practiced in the field can never be understood uh, in a classroom. There's too much going on, okay? Now taking this approach, being scientific, okay? Looking, you know, standing on those shoulders of, gi uh, of giants and taking in the view, okay? And being systematic about your approach, okay? Could be the difference between stuck out there at night, working, working, that looks fun when you're freezing cold, right? <laughs> or maybe having your things together, and maybe it'll work like this guy. That's all natural stuff we just picked out there. OK. So that, that's the difference in approach. OK, those guys are both after the same thing. But one, one about it a little bit smarter, didn't he? <laughs> That's all our info. Uh, thanks for my 15 minutes of fame up here. I appreciate it.